Thanks, Rita. Tonight's on BBC London. The mayor announces a freeze on tube and bus fares. It comes weeks after a government bailout for London's transport network. It's really, really hard at the minute. So when you're getting on a bus and then a tube and then another bus, it all adds up. So now I think that's a really good idea. But I think long-term economy-wise, I don't think that's very smart, to be honest. There's probably wiser ways of offloading costs to us. Also on the programme. The latest on the case of a newborn baby girl found in a shopping bag in sub-zero temperatures in East London. Police say she's safe in hospital. Fly tipping's on the rise. New figures show eight London boroughs are among the worst hotspots in England. And we set sail with the North London school children gaining recognition and new life skills. Hello there, I'm Sonia Jessup. Tube and bus fares will be frozen till March 2025. That was the announcement from the mayor today. Sadiq Khan says Londoners could save up to £90 a year. The Conservatives at City Hall have accused him of trying to buy votes ahead of May's mayoral election. It comes weeks after the government stepped in with a multi-million pound bailout for TfL. Frankie McCamley has this report. Every day, so many of us will be tapping in and out, watching closely to see how much it costs. And the price of those fares can dictate which way voters go, especially in mayoral elections. Today, Sadiq Khan has announced he will freeze TfL fares until March 2025. I've seen the difference uh, I can make from uh, City Hall, supporting Londoners during the cost of living crisis, but also, really importantly, supporting London's culture, hospitality and retail sector, but also helping the return to the office. Your political opponents have said you've shaken the magic money tree. What do you say to them? Well, listen, uh, Londoners know every time I can freeze fares, I do so. I did for the first five years of my uh, uh, mayoralty. But some political opponents believe the mayor is trying to bribe voters. Sadiq Khan has already put £12.50 on Londoners in outer London that can't afford the ULO's expansion. He's increased lots of other things. We're three months away from the mayoral election and I think Londoners aren't stupid. They'll know what he's doing here. So what do commuters think of the plans? It cost me five fifty to get to work and I'm travelling three stops, so I think it's right. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Um, it's, really, it's really, really hard at the minute, so when you're getting on a bus and then a tube and then another bus, it all adds up. I think long-term economy-wise, I don't think that's very smart, to be honest. There's probably wiser ways of offloading costs to us. Oh, thank God. If I'm honest, I thought they were going up. They've been going up a lot and, uh, nah, well, a bit of good news on a Friday, I suppose, but hopefully a bit more to come, eh? Whilst welcoming the freeze in fares, the Green Party has called for more budget transparency from the mayor. The Lib Dems have questioned where the £123 million shortfall will come from. Quite where it comes from, where the space was found. Uh, it'll take further forensic analysis in the days and weeks ahead. But, as I said at the beginning, what this definitely does is open clear water between the Labour candidate's offer and mm. the leading contender, the, uh, uh, contender, the Conservatives offer. And with mayoral campaigns gathering pace, soon it will be up to Londoners to decide whether transport pledges like this will get their vote on board. Frankie McCamley, BBC London. That's our top story also coming up on tonight's programme. We catch up with the London actress Tracy Ann Oberman, building, bringing a new twist to Shakespeare in the West End. But first, let's get more on the newborn baby girl who was found inside a shopping bag in sub-zero temperatures in East London. Police say she was less than an hour old and she's now being cared for in hospital. Aisha Buksh sent this report from Newham. 
Well, this is the area where the newborn baby was found, not far from the A13 in the Beckton East Ham uh, part of East London. Police say that last night around 9.15, someone who was out walking their dog discovered the baby girl in a shopping bag uh, and she'd been wrapped in a towel. Police have thanked locals who stayed with the baby until the paramedics arrived and took her to hospital and they say that their actions contributed to saving the baby's life. I'm delighted to report that she wasn't injured in any way and is safe and well in the care of hospital staff. They have given her a temporary name, Elsa. We believe she's a black or mixed race child. I am extremely grateful to the members of the public who stayed at the scene to speak with officers and medics. Your actions contributed to saving Elsa's life. We believe Elsa to have been less than an hour old when she was found. We do not yet know how long she had been there when she was found. Our thoughts now turn to the baby's mother. We are extremely concerned for her welfare as she will have been through a traumatic ordeal and will be in need of immediate medical attention following the birth. Trained medics and specialist officers are ready to support her and we urge her to get in touch by phone or walk into the nearest hospital or police station. If you are the baby's mother, please know that your daughter is well. No matter what your circumstances, please do seek help by dialing 999. We have said the baby, despite freezing temperatures last night, wasn't injured in any way and she is doing well and being looked after by hospital staff. Arsha Baksh with that report. Now, take a look at this. Not, in fact, a rubbish dump, but the mess left behind by fly tippers at a site in Bexley. These pictures were sent to us by a viewer, frustrated at the blight and the damage she says it's causing to wildlife. It's a problem that is on the rise in parts of London. Here's Tolu Adioye. This used to be an area local people could come to enjoy wildlife. Now it's become a dumping ground. Fridge freezer, tyres, it's just literally anything, anything that you're going to chuck out, that I think that they're just giving them to illegal waste people and they're just bringing them down here. Kim has lived in the Erith area all her life. She contacted BBC London concerned about the fly tipping along the marshes. This is a big problem. This stretch of road is about a mile long and either side it has ditches which are filled up with household clients. Um, loads and loads of tyres and it just gets worse and worse. Sometimes a bit of it's cleared and then it just all comes back again. We understand this land is privately owned, but the latest data shows eight London council areas are in the top 10 list for most fly tips in England. Brent is the worst affected area with nearly 35,000 incidents reported, followed by Camden and Westminster. The stats show rates have increased by 4% across the capital year on year, but nationally they've fallen slightly. There are a couple of things that councils can do to try and deter fly tippers. They could take enforcement action, which would see offenders prosecuted, and then they could see themselves facing an unlimited fine or even a prison sentence. Uh, they could also issue a fixed penalty fine, and London councils issue the most of these of anywhere in the country. The local government association wants a review of sentencing guidelines to see bigger fines for more serious offences. In a statement, the government has said, we are helping councils to take the fight to criminals with additional grants to tackle fly tipping, hire £1,000 on the spot fines for offenders and powers to stop, search and seize vehicles suspected of being used for fly tipping. I mean, it's just killing the natural environment. Like Thomas said, there used to be so many animals in there. used to be sort of like frogs, toads, newts, things like that. Now, all you find in there is fridges. Um, TVs, you name it. Paint. Kim has her own ideas on how fly tipping could be deterred in known hotspots. I think they do need to put working cameras, hidden cameras all the way along here and someone has to man them. It does really make me feel sick and it makes me really angry. Tolua Deoye, BBC London. And as I mentioned, that story was sent in to us by Kim, who you saw there. If you've got a problem with fly tipping in your area or there's another story you'd love us to look into, do get in touch. The email is hello BBC London at bbc.co.uk. Well, let's take a quick look at some of the day's other news now. 
A six-year-old girl has been hurt in a car crash in Orpington after traffic lights with ULES cameras attached to them were cut down. Police said people who sabotaged them were putting the public at risk. The girl's injuries are not thought to be life-threatening. A nurse has been struck off after making racist comments about her colleagues. Kinga Lesniak admitted using slurs while working at St Mary's Hospital in Paddington in August 2021. The Nursing and Midwifery Council said her misconduct posed significant risk of harm to the public. Google has invested £790 million to build its first UK data centre in Hertfordshire. The tech giant said construction had started at a 33-acre site in Waltham Cross and hoped it would be completed by 2025. Next, a call to action. That's what the UK Health Security Agency has called for over fears that measles is likely to spread rapidly, rapidly across the UK. Here in London, there is particular concern because vaccination rates are considered very low. NHS figures show just 74% of children starting school last year had had both their MMR doses. Well, let's speak now to Dr. Fazana Hussein, who is a GP in Newham. Thank you for coming in. Um, we had 44 cases of measles in London in, in December, um, the same number in January. They, they might sound like small numbers, but considering this was a disease we were saying was eradicated you know, a couple of years ago, how, how significant is this? How worried should we be? Well, exactly that. This was a disease that luckily people in my generation haven't seen. We thought of this as a Victorian disease. So to see this increase and particularly the drop in vaccination rates is really concerning because measles is a highly contagious, highly infectious illness affecting young children who, of course, are always loving each other and hugging each other, but spreading viruses very rapidly. And, you know, we heard this is because of a, 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 a low take up of the vaccine. I mean, how, why do, why do you think that is? What's behind it? Well, I think there's been a number of things. I think people are understandably a, a bit tired of vaccinations. We've had COVID vaccinations. All of the vaccinations are really important. We need to remember that vaccinations and clean water have been the, the, the biggest triumphs of public health and why we don't lose young children any, anymore as we did in the Victorian times. But the, the, the vaccination vaccination rate is now very low and we need it at 95%, which sounds high, but if we don't have that, that means that even those children who are vaccinated, nobody is safe. Unless we're all vaccinated, nobody is safe. And, and do you think people have sort of forgotten how serious this can actually be? Yes. It can be a, it's a very unpleasant. Absolutely. Dangerous. People think, oh, measles, it's just like having flu or it's such a cough or cold. Measles can have very serious complications like meningitis or pneumonia, and, and in rare cases, it can cause death so it is a very dangerous illness that has no cure and vaccination is the way to keep ourselves protected. So when you're seeing people in your, your patients or parents coming in what, what would you say to them are you having those kind of conversations do you have time to sort of perhaps if they're coming in for something else to kind of encourage them? Yes definitely I mean in London we were fortunate that even last summer London had a catch-up campaign so anybody who had missed their vaccination which is normally given at the age of one year and the second those at the age of three years, four months, any child up to the age of 10 was still being offered in special clinics. Now, although those special clinics have stopped, it's never too late to have your vaccination. And I'm letting all my patients know and their carers and parents know, if you haven't had your child vaccinated, come forward and get that vaccine done. And you can check the, the, the famous red book that many parents can, have with yes. their child in, or call your GP, presumably, to check. And it, what symptoms should you be aware of? I mean, presumably, if you think your child does have measles, what do you do? Do you try to treat that at home or when, when do you know if it might become something serious? I think it's always good to, to seek medical advice and the measles has a very typical rash. Measles starts like any other viral illness, a cough and a cold. So at that point, the first four or five days, we wouldn't know. No parent, no doctor would necessarily know. But if you've got a, a child with a rash, it's definitely worth coming forward to get that checked out. It's not something we'd be able to diagnose at home. And check that you're up to date with, with vaccinations. OK, Dr. Dr. Fazana Hussain, thank you very much for joining us. Well, lots more to come, including. Coming up on this week's Politics London, the thousands of passengers tapping in at London Liverpool Street heading to London Stansted, who are furious to be fined upon arrival for not having bought a physical ticket. So do join me this Sunday morning at 10 on BBC One. See you then.
Now, leaving behind everything and fleeing to a new country, it's hard to imagine the challenges that child refugees face arriving in the capital. St Saviour's Primary School in North London has been helping support a family from Syria through a scheme called Schools of Sanctuary. It's a project that's been helping thousands of young people across the UK. Megan Owen has more. This is what morning assembly looks like at a school of sanctuary, asking big questions. What do you think it might be like to be a refugee, to leave your home and to be forced to move somewhere else? What might that be like? Talk and creating a welcoming space for refugees. Recently, St Saviour's raised enough money to resettle a Syrian family into Walthamstow. Seven-year-old Sundas and her father, Abdullah, spoke to us with the help of a translator, a school staff member who also came to London as a refugee. He said, thank you a lot, thank him a lot, and uh, he couldn't express his feeling, but he's very grateful. <laughs> yeah, everyone say hi to her. All the children, staff, uh, all, all, everyone met, meet her, say hi. <laughs> She's like, like it. <laughs> we have built a community um, of, of children, of parents, of staff who are really understanding the plight of refugees. We've had um, uh, people living in a hotel close by our schools um, and, it's, and the children have been doing a huge amount of work for the children in the hotel. There's about 90 children living in a hotel. So we're trying at as many opportunities as we can to show care and kindness um, in the smallest possible ways. His work is paying off. I want to be like a welcoming person and I want to make a, um, a lot of friends from different backgrounds and cultures. It just makes everyone feel like they can fit in. Now I know that refugees are people who are forced to leave their country because of many dangerous things that can happen to them. We can probably make a difference to how people think and how people can help. The school rehoused Sunda's family with the help of a local mosque through a Home Office approved community sponsorship scheme. The opportunity to work with St Saviour's Church of England School has been uh, incredible. We, we have so much in common in our faith uh, as well as beyond faith and just sharing of those humanitarian ideals and knowing that there are people out there suffering and that we can do something to help them. It's been a community cross-faith effort to transform this school into a sanctuary. Megan Owen, BBC London. Next, a new twist on Shakespeare. The Merchant of Venice is opening in the West End next month. It stars Tracy Ann Oberman in the traditionally male role of Shylock, here reimagined as a Jewish single mum. And the play is set in the East End of London, Cable Street, 1936, when fascism is on the rise. We are going to speak to Tracy Ann in just a moment, but first, here's a look at the production. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not love? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? Wow. Well, Tracy Ann joins us now. Thank Hello. you for coming Thanks in. Thanks for having me on. And we should say, if people don't know this play at all, I mean, yeah. they, they, we, you mentioned Shylock, the, the main character that, that you, you've reinvented. But traditionally, I mean, he's very controversial. I, I think you said as a, as a Jewish girl growing up in North London, you, you hated this play. I've always hated this play. It's a very difficult play. People are saying that it shouldn't really be produced in the canon of Shakespeare anymore. It's um, it's got a deeply anti-Semitic character, but I wanted to reclaim it and see what would happen if you turned this, this moneylender um, into a woman and to see what that did to the relationship with her daughter, Jessica, and to set it in a time um, of, you know, we're looking at British history and we're looking at colonialism and slavery, but also the Brits have a, a long flirtation with fascism. And I thought the stories I was brought up with by my great grandmother, which is who I based my Shylock on, she came over from the pogroms of Belarus. She loved England. She called it the Golden Medina. And yet in 1936, she came face to face with Oswald Mosley and the British Union of Fascists at the Battle of Cable Street. And this is a civil rights moment so yeah, where all the other minorities 
minorities pull together with the Jewish neighbors, the Irish working class, the English working class, the Afro-Caribbean community, the dockers, the sailors, and they said, if you come for the Jews, you come for us all. And they all joined hands and they kind of overthrew Mosley's march, fully protected by the police on a very violent day. And it was a great moment. So I think the play broaches two things. One is a female Shylock, the Jewish experience of being an immigrant in the East End as a woman. Um, it reclaims the Shakespeare, but it also sets it against a very specific moment in British history. Yeah, and, and, and why was this such a... It was such a special project because it was a, a personal yeah. experience of your, of your Absolutely. Family. Like I say, I wanted to reclaim the play. I don't think you should take it out of the syllabus. I think it's a... or out of the, you know, the canon. But I think you can do it in a way to teach about prejudice and othering. I also think, in my own experience of standing up to anti-Semitism, and a lot of female friends of mine who stood up to racism, if you are a minority, the in, there's a real thing about um, sort of misogyny and being another. And so having this Jewish female Shylock standing up against the aristocracy, standing up against the sort of the British black shirts that were all made up of sort of Nancy Mitford and Oswald mm. Mosley, who was great friends with Hitler, um, you know, it, it, it brings out something interesting. But also, it's under two hours. It's a very sexy play. It's uh, two hours with an interval. Also, it started off as a very small project, but it's just... It's taken over the country. It went hearts and, it, and minds and around. And at the moment, as you as you prepare to open in the West End, it's it, it set against a, 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 a backdrop now of this conflict between Israel and Gaza and um, rising hate, rising anti-Semitism, rising Islamophobia, mm. a tenfold rise in anti-Semitism. How? What kind of resonance do you think that's for? I think weirdly, I thought it was zeitgeisty when I first did it, um, and then you know this has been going on for a year and it's just grown and grown around the country. We're living in really febrile times and there are greater enemies out there that want to have minorities pitted against each other but we're all human we're all suffering these are really difficult times and we have to like at the Battle of Cable Street learn to stand together to share and experience each other's pain from both sides of the conflict but what's upsetting is it you know a conflict is going on in a foreign country but it's the rise in anti-semitism and Islamophobia in this country and globally that I feel other parties are whipping up and we've got to take stock because when you allow racism and anti-Semitism to flourish in your country, all other evils follow. Um, history has proven that time and time again. And how are audiences responding Unbelievable. to Unbelievable. I am so grateful and we've got shortlisted, uh, we're, we're in the runnings for What's On Stage Award, Best Revival, against huge shows, massive shows. This show has been propelled into the West End by audiences who've just loved it and taken the message to their heart. and. We've been in theatres all around the country where they've said this is one of the biggest selling shows we've had since COVID. Who knew that a little Shakespeare that I kind of thought up and worked on with Bridget Larmore would have turned into a, a bit of a movement? And I am honestly so grateful for audiences. Well, we, we wish you all the best with it. From, as I say, I think the Palace Theatre in, in Watford and, and now in the West End. So, yeah, so going back break to Scotland a leg. and then 15th to the 23rd. 15th, great, at the Criterion Theatre. 15th great. of March, 15th of okay. February, 23rd of March. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much, you. Tracy and Oberman. Next, uh, sailing has long had a reputation as something of an elitist sport, but one school in North London has been breaking down barriers. For 10 years, Greg City Academy has been gaining recognition for turning out top sailors and transforming the lives of their students. Let's take a look. So when my parents first found out I was sailing, they were like, what's sailing? You're just on a boat. But once I qualified and now I'm a sailing instructor, they realise that I'm actually getting somewhere. It's not what they expected. Are you nervous? Yeah. Don't be. We went on eBay, we bought initially a 22-foot boat, did it up, realised it wasn't very good, so then looked again, and this time we found a really classic uh, uh, racing yacht. We were advised not to buy it, so we bought it. We then spent about another two years raising the money to get the boat up to spec, and then we started racing it. And we did our first race back in 2017, and we won it. Oh, 
Our busiest day was probably um, every Fridays because usually that's when we leave from school to go to the trips. So it's quite a busy day because it's wake up, school, trip, get back to um, London by Sunday and then we have to do catch up with the homework to be prepared for Monday. It's a bit difficult but like sometimes we'll do homework together. And then go from the decimal point or three and then go backwards. Yeah. No, backwards, backwards, bro, backwards, this way. So it's all about like balancing it, but it's, it's not too hard. Greg City Academy is located in Hornsey. Nearly all of the students from our school are drive from East Haringey. A lot of them do come from disadvantaged backgrounds, but I think what impresses me about them is, is they, don't let, they don't sort of let that be a barrier to participation and things which they perceive are difficult. And you can see more on that story on The Travel Show at 1.30 and 8.30pm tomorrow on the BBC News Channel. It's on iPlayer 2. Uh, not sure it's great weather for taking a boat out at the moment. Uh, Sarah Keith Lucas is here. I do know it's it's very cold out there. <laughs> it is, isn't it? It's cold, but there's been some sunshine. Not too much of that, I'm afraid, over the next few days. This was the view, the skyline of London looking beautiful out there today, but it certainly has felt chilly. But as we head through the weekend, it's all changed because we've got the next named storm on the way, Storm Isha, and that's going to arrive for us particularly later on Sunday and into Monday, so the weather turning increasingly windy, but much milder if you've been hoping for uh, those temperatures to rise. So out there through the rest of this evening and overnight then, clear skies for most of us, relatively light winds. Temperatures will dip down below freezing for a time, but it looks like they'll just start to rise again through the early hours of Saturday. So you might wake up to a little bit of a frost, but it won't be such a, a severe sharp frost as we've seen over recent days. So I think two or three for many of us first thing Saturday. Now through the day, it is looking largely dry. Again, there'll be plenty of sunshine around through the morning, Bit of a change into the afternoon, the clouds starts to increase, the breeze starts to pick up and that is a sign of things to come. So won't be as cold as it has been, temperatures up to around about six degrees or so for some of us, perhaps even seven in the centre of the city. But as we head through Saturday night into Sunday, things are going to change. That's when we see the wind increasing, the cloud increasing as well could be a few spots of rain around but I think it is going to be mainly the wind that causes disruption but just look at those temperatures up to around about 13 degrees or so so it really will feel different compared to what we've seen over the past couple of weeks the rain looks like it'll sweep in later in the day but the winds are going to be gusting 50 miles per hour even a bit more than that particularly strong winds Sunday evening and overnight into Monday as well so here is storm Isha making its way from west to east across the UK bringing us some rain but some strong and disruptive winds so do keep tuned to your latest forecast Sonia keep it wrapped up too thank you Sarah and that's it from me I will be back later at 10 30 have a lovely evening Bye-bye.